From the day its first nine holes opened in 1937, Prairie Dunes Country Club was considered the most unique course in the Midwest. With its fairways and greens draped over rolling sand dunes that had been deposited by the meandering Arkansas River northeast of Hutchinson, Kansas, Prairie Dunes was hailed as an American version of a Scottish lynx. Golf architect Perry Maxwell considered the land a natural canvas and the finest natural topography for a golf course anywhere in the world. Three years after Perry's death in 1952, his son Jay Press Maxwell was retained to expand the course to 18 holes. Press added three holes to complete a front nine and six to form a back nine. And when the full 18 opened in 1957, a new generation of critics proclaimed Prairie Dunes a hidden treasure, offering seaside golf in the midst of a prairie. Its design showcases the grandest elements of Kansas golf, with rumple fairways and sloping greens edged by vast meadowland roughs of big and little blue stem, blue grama, needlegrass, and gnarly plum thickets. Certain holes are framed by groves of tall cottonwoods, the state tree, and deep bunkers are dotted with spiny soapweed plants, commonly known as yucca. There's also the ever-present wind, sent with blast furnace intensity from Oklahoma every summer and bone-chilling velocity from the Dakotas in early spring and late fall. The course is a thrilling collection of challenging elements, a genuine surprise for those who've not previously visited the Great Plains. This is Every Hole at Prairie Dunes Country Club. Named Carrie Lane for the Carrie brothers who founded the club, the opening hole at Prairie Dunes is a strong dogleg left par four into the prevailing southwest wind, leaving the turn well past the range of many average drives. A good tee shot down the left side might still result in a blind approach shot over a ridge of sand dune, while a tee shot out to the right can provide a view of the green, but leaves a much longer second. The green is a classic Perry Maxwell creation that rolls off in three different directions. Back in 1986, Ben Crenshaw and his design partner reworked the green ever so slightly, and it's not been altered since. From tee boxes just beyond the first green, the par 3 second plays uphill to a diagonal putting surface benched into the side of a sand hill. Club selection is crucial as the hole plays into the wind. The green is only 25 yards deep and five bunkers await, positioned as sports writer Mal Elliott once wrote, like beaks of baby birds waiting to be fed. Two big bunkers in front are 12 feet below the putting surface, but the wide trap recessed in the hill beyond the green poses the toughest recovery. From there, the undulating green slopes back toward the front collar. The third, nicknamed Wild Plum, is the first of three consecutive holes added by Press Maxwell in the 1950s. It is the shortest par four at Prairie Dunes, with a very tricky downhill, downwind tee shot to an angled fairway. Fades must challenge left-hand dunes that are covered in waist-high grasses and wild plum thickets, the stuff members call the gunch, while a straight drive could run through the fairway into bunkers on the right, or worse yet, into the right-hand sand dunes. The smart play is to lay up with less than driver and leave a short iron second over a necklace of bunkers to the heart of the green. With slopes all around its perimeter, the putting surface successfully imitates Perry Maxwell's trademark rolls. Armchair critics contend that Press Maxwell's par 3 fourth is merely the mirror image of his father's par 3 second. That may be, but this whole place considerably different. Though much the same length as the second, the tee shot is usually one club longer because the green is higher up the hillside. Press aligned the green to the northwest and slanted it so shots can ride the prevailing wind and stay on the green. But shots that end up above the hole pose difficult putts back downhill. The thumb of fairway on the left does provide a bailout option, but balls hitting it quite often trickle farther downhill, resulting in pitch shot recoveries of 30 yards or more. Press's original plan showed the fifth as a 480 yard par five, but when it was built, it was shortened to a 430 yard par four remaining plenty difficult in the face of a southwest wind. In recent years, new hilltop tees have been added, and today the 482-yard fifth plays as a championship par four and a member's par five. Although it contains lots of little humps and bumps in one bunker, the fifth fairway is probably the widest and flattest on the property. The perched green is deep enough to hold a long iron or metalwood approach, but simply hitting it is only half the challenge. Like the fairway, the green has lots of subtle humps and hollows, 
so two putts are not automatic. The next five holes are part of Perry Maxwell's original nine. The par 4-6 looks magnificent from tee boxes nearly 50 feet above the fairway, which begins in a hollow and rises in a gentle curve to the left around a challenge bunker some 250 yards out. Down the far right rough line sits another bunker added by Corn Crenshaw in 2005. At 320 yards from the back tee, it's in play only for long hitters. From the fairway landing area, a left-hand bunker seems right in front of the green, but in truth it's 25 yards short. So one must trust the yardage guide and not be fooled by the visual. The green is dramatic in its contours and has been the scene of more than one putt racing past the pin and completely off the green. Seven is the most altered hole on the property. Originally a 440 yard par four, it was lengthened 60 yards in the late 1950s into a short downwind par five. For decades, the tee shot was simple. Just avoid a single bunker in the left hand rough. In 2005, Corn Crenshaw added two bunkers that eat into the fairway. One on the left at 300 yards off the tee, the other on the right about 325 yards out. Still, with the help of the south wind, the green is reachable for many, although flanking greenside bunkers were reworked in the nearly 1980s to pinch the approach to the green, which is long and narrow with pronounced knolls. All in all, seven is considered a birdie hole. The eighth is an exquisite hole. As a long dogleg right par four, it is foolhardy to try and cut the corner as the prevailing wind pushes shots farther right into deep rough. The fairway is like rolling surf, a series of four peaks and valleys, each ridge higher than the previous, and tee shots settling in any trough can result in blind second shots to the hilltop green unprotected from the wind. And what a green it is candid from back left to front right with four pot bunkers recessed into a hillside below and a wide bunker gnawing at the left collar. Holding putts from above the hole takes special skill. In 1965, sports writer Dan Jenkins declared this hole to be the best eighth hole in the country, and over half a century later, nothing contradicts his assessment. Many feel the slightly longer par 4 ninth is an even stronger hole than the eighth because it encounters a steady crosswind off the elevated tee all the way to the green. Again, the fairway pitches and heaves in several directions, which can blunt the roll of tee shots and provide awkward lies for approach shots. Like the sixth, the ninth has a slightly elevated deceptive green positioned beyond a dip and a knoll, making it hard to judge the precise hole location. Best to aim for the center of the green, as contours in front, along the sides, and behind repel shots into hollows and bunkers. Members still talk about how Jack Nicholas took an eight on this hole in the 1960s exhibition match against Arnold Palmer. The par 3 tenth provides perhaps the most intimidating tee shot on the course. Because the tee complex is directly beside the club's dining room windows, and because the elevated green is partially hidden by dunes covered in tall grasses, thickets, and yucca plants. Guarded by a trio of yawning bunkers, the green is just 32 yards deep, shallow for a downed wind hole, with a deep hollow off the back collar. The masterfully carved green contains some of the boldest contours of any at Prairie Dunes. Perry Maxwell considered the tenth hole to be the most beautiful par three he'd ever constructed. Now comes the six-hole stretch on the back nine designed and built by Perry's son, Press Maxwell. Eleven is the longest par four on the course. The drive must be long and precise, not just avoiding the massive trap at the corner of the dogleg left, but getting past it. No easy task as it's positioned over 300 yards from the back tee. The second shot is most often a long iron that must be carried all the way to the putting surface, as there's a pesky knob directly in front that will kick balls left and right into greenside bunkers. Anything through this short green will be snagged by a third bunker directly behind. Listed as a par 5 from the members tees, conventional wisdom is to play the 11th as a 3-shot hole from any tee, as it provides no shortcuts. While the 12th has always been a very short par 4, two events have changed its personality. The first was the addition in the early 1980s of new tee boxes atop a high sand hill, which added 60 yards to the hole, as well as dramatic new vistas. The other was the demise of a towering cottonwood tree that stood in the very center of the fairway, just 75 yards short of the green. 
damaged by lightning, it was removed in the late 1990s. While several other trees still pinched the approach shot, in the past there was no gap between trees in which to play a conventional second shot. Approaches either had to be lofted clear over that cottonwood or bounced under it. The tiny putting surface at 12 is Press Maxwell's best green, sloping off to the left, right, and behind. Some members consider the 13th to be the toughest drive at Prairie Dunes because the prevailing south wind and the slope of the fairway both push balls to the left into tandem bathtub bunkers that define the turn of the fairway. Drives aimed to the right that run through the fairway will likely land into one of the three high side bunkers. The green is elevated beyond flanking traps and warrants an extra club on the second shot. It is ringed by slopes, including one on the right that rolls downhill 20 yards into a grass hollow. 13 green is a small target that looks big from afar. Yet another dogleg left, the par 4 14th, called Cottonwood on the scorecard, plays from ridgetop tee boxes over a corner of deep rough into a valley fairway that leads to a green tucked into a grove of cottonwoods. For many years, so many players lost tee shots in the deep left rough that in 1983, longtime superintendent Doug Peterson established a massive sandy waste bunker to replace the rough. More recently, consulting architect Dave Axlin reshaped it to look like two big conventional bunkers. The rolling green, always in shade for many hours each day, often putts a bit slower than others on the course. The longest par three at Prairie Dunes plays through a very narrow corridor between tall cottonwoods, which is why the hole is called the chute. Its convex green is positioned atop a hill and is swept by left to right prevailing wind that is hard to judge from the tee. While this is the largest green on the course, it's still less than 5,000 square feet, a reminder of just how tiny the targets are on this course. Also of note, all four par threes at Prairie Dunes play uphill although few notice that fact during play. The last of the Press Maxwell holes is a stern par four that plays uphill and into the south wind. The landing area is generous, unless one attempts to squeeze past the left and right bunkers recessed on an upslope, but at 300 yards from the tips, few challenge those traps. As the second shot is also into the teeth of the wind, the green is 40 yards long, the deepest on the course. A kick slope along the left will guide shots down onto the putting surface, but a down slope on the back right will send right side shots clear off the green. When Prairie Dunes was just nine holes, this was a short dogleg right par five. Then Prairie Sun expanded the course to 18, and he built new tees to straighten and lengthen this par five, but the old dogleg fairway still remains. Although into the wind, the tee shot is one of the easiest on the course. It's the green that's the dawning challenge. A narrow surface perched on a ridge with a fingery bunker running up the left side and an extreme drop off along the right. Crenshaw calls 17 a confounding green. Others term it the most dangerous one on the course. We should note there are only two par fives at Prairie Dunes, this and number seven, which runs in the opposite direction. One of the two always plays into the wind with the other downwind. 18 is a relatively short par four for a closing hole. It is a superb test of shot making. The tees are positioned so the fairways at a diagonal, forcing golfers to carry what they dare over a long ridge of sand dunes along the right. A complicated shot with the wind pushing left to right and the fairway canting right to left. The downwind second shot can't easily be bounced onto the green because of a gully in front of it. So it takes a high iron approach to hit and hold the small knobby green that's crowded by sand bunkers left, right, and behind. The 18th is the consummate match play hole, a short par four where a birdie can win it all. Except for the 2001 U.S. Women's Open and the 2006 U.S. Senior Open, all other championships contested at Prairie Dunes have been match play events. And that's quite fitting because it's less painful to lose a hole following an encounter with a plum thicket, briar patch, or yucca plant than it is to count the total number of strokes needed to extract oneself from any of those hazards. That's the essence of Prairie Dunes. It's the true opponent of every golfer who plays it. That's a big reason why it's been ranked among Golf Digest's 100 Greatest Golf Courses ever since the Top 100 ranking began in 1969.